Having been said, let me introduce you to Dr. Matthew Eschelbach. Dr. Eschelbach is up in Redmond, Oregon. He is an assistant medical director with us, been with us for several years. Um, EMS medical director for services there, speaks on the EMS circuit up on the Northwest Coast, and his lectures are always uh, right on the money for what we need for things that it seems like that as students, sometimes we either have issues with or, you know, just can't get enough out of the, the existing lectures in the textbooks. So hypothermia and cold-related injuries is very timely, and I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to turn my video off for just a second. There we go. And um, the reason we talk about this is obvious <clears throat> uh, this time of year. Uh, we do it at this time of year because you're going to run into uh, quite a few cold-related injuries this time of year, <clears throat> either uh, in your job, uh, in EMS, or maybe your volunteer work in uh, search and rescue, or it might be, uh, depending on where you live, um, just something that you find important, uh, you know, if you drive, and uh, see a car by the side of the road, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> in the background of this slide, uh, whited out is uh, Mount Bachelor, which is our home mountain. And this is taken uh, looking at Mount Bachelor from the uh, wilderness area where plenty of people uh, snowshoe, uh, they cross country ski and snowmobile. And anytime things break down uh, or people get injured uh, or they get lost, uh, they are subject to a uh, possibility of a cold related injury or hypothermia. <clears throat> All right, we'll move forward. First off, uh, let's talk a little bit about epidemiology. Uh, Hypothermia is described classically as a temperature less than 35 degrees centigrade. That would be 95 Fahrenheit. Uh, greater than 700 people die each year from some form of hypothermia. You don't have to be in the wilderness. It could be in the community. It could be under a bridge. Uh, half of those are 65 years or older. And the extremes of age, meaning the very young and the very old, are at greatest risk. We'll talk a little bit about the physiology of temperature control and uh, how you lose heat. Uh, first off, you can lose heat by conduction, and that's the transfer of heat by direct contact down a temperature gradient. I'll show you a good picture of that in just a minute. Uh, convection. That's the transfer of heat by movement of heated materials, such as the uh, wind, or lack of heat, such as the wind. Radiation, which is the loss of heat from non-insulated areas. And respiration and water evaporation, which is the loss of uh, heat through exhalation and breathing. Uh, we lose about 65% of our heat from radiation uh, that's an exposed body area. Conduction about two to three percent. Convection 10 to 15 percent. And evaporation uh, 20 to 35 percent. So here's a good example of our uh, gentleman who is in a cold area. Uh, he's sitting on a rock and uh, his bottom is in contact with the rock and therefore He's losing heat by conduction exchange into the rock. The wind is blowing quickly and convection is taking heat away from him. Uh, he's sweating and evaporating and he's also respiring, letting uh, CO2 and water out. And of course, uh, radiation, uh, as long as he has heat, he's going to give it to something that has less heat and this way he's radiating it to the environment. So wind and wetness are the two biggest uh, producers that can lead to losing body heat faster. 
Uh, so um, one extra thing to add to that is metabolism, because as long as you are burning calories, uh, your metabolism is going to use up heat and you will also uh, give it up as we talked about. Heat gain is the same way. Uh, we lose it by evaporation and sweat and convection. And um, we're going to sometimes gain heat through solar radiation and conduction with the ground. Hypothermia is treated and categorized by dividing it into um, different forms that we'll go over. This is a nice uh, quick representation. Uh, 37.5 or 38 or so is normal. And then uh, as we go down, we get into shivering and then um, we get into our types of hypothermia, which I'll um, go over. This note here is still true. You're not dead until you're warm or dead. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, why that's true and not so true. Um, but it has to do with uh, the ability to um, conduct again in your heart after your heart is warm. So mild hypothermia <clears throat> is usually 33 to 35 degrees centigrade. Uh, we would know it as 91.4 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we have some excitation at this point in time. Uh, there are physiologic adjustments made to retain the heat. Moderate hypothermia is 34 to 32 degrees centigrade. Um, the heat loss here is adynamic, meaning our metabolism slows. We decrease our oxygen demand and we also decrease CO2 production. And severe hypothermia uh, is less than 32 degrees uh, centigrade. Some will categorize uh, severe hypothermia as less than 30 degrees, depending on your source. And this is where shivering ceases uh, altogether and um, we begin to rapidly decline. So when we talk about mild hypothermia, uh, the things that happen in the body to compensate are an increased metabolic rate. You begin to break down uh, a little bit faster uh, the metabolites in your body. Uh, you get maximum shivering. Shivering happens so that you can, uh, your muscles can fasciculate past each other and they will um, create heat and thermogenesis. Um, at this point, you get some amnesia. Uh, some dysarthria, almost like a stroke or ataxia, meaning that you're not very good at movement. Your movements become slower. Uh, you get loss of coordination. You usually have uh, tachycardia, which is a rapid heartbeat above 100, and tachypnea, which is a rapid breathing above 20. Uh, but you usually maintain a normal blood pressure. Moderate hypothermia. Uh, is the beginning of a stupor. Uh, your shivering uh, has stopped and you become more bradycardic and you're uh, susceptible to arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation. Your blood pressure and your respiratory rate go down and uh, your pupils begin to dilate and they'll become much more dilated, uh, less than 30 degrees. And severe hypothermia uh, most of these folks are comatose and they have no corneal uh, reflex. The corneal or oculocephalic reflex is when you take a Q-tip on an open eye and you touch it to the eye and the eye doesn't blink at all. Uh, your blood pressure is down. Uh, V-fib risk goes significantly up. Uh, apnea or no breathing happens and your heart can stop. Uh, you don't have reflexes and your pupils can become fixed. And at 19 degrees, that's when your brain essentially turns off and your EEG, not your EKG, your EEG of your brain uh, essentially flatlines. 
So what is the uh, physiology of this? Um, above 32 degrees, uh, which we know is our uh, mild uh, hypothermia, we begin to get vasoconstriction and shivering, and we get an increase in the basal metabolic rate. Now vasoconstriction happens peripherally, so that means in your fingers, in your hands, in your toes, in your legs, your body and the small veins of your body shrink out and they try and keep the warmest blood towards your core. And your core is everything above uh, your thighs and uh, inside of your uh, shoulders. So your body is willing to say, you can have my arms, you can have my legs, but I'm, you're going, going to keep my head, my heart, my lungs, and my abdomen moving. <clears throat> Shivering, we talked about, happens uh, to create heat. Uh, below 32 degrees, shivering stops and the body just begins to rapidly lose heat. Below 24 degrees, uh, you have no basal metabolic rate and your body is not carrying on any form of glycolysis or breaking down uh, for energy at all. Uh, in the hypothermic patient, we get EKG changes and we can get life-threatening arrhythmias. Uh, we'll go over these, each of these, we'll get uh, Osborne waves, uh, you can get T-wave inversion, you can get PR, QRS, and QT prolongation, and your arrhythmias can be a bradycardia, a slow AFib, or a ventricular fibrillation, or a systole. And a typical progression goes from sinus bradycardia to asystole. You may pass any one of these on the way there. <clears throat> this is a good test question. They like to show you this on a test and uh, usually a multiple choice question. Uh, Mr. John Osborne in the 1950s uh, when uh, researching uh, EKG changes in hypothermia, uh, discovered the Osborne wave, and it usually is seen when temperature goes below 33 degrees. It's seen in about 30% or one third of the patients, and you get this positive negative deflection like this here with this funny little QRST abnormality. Uh, here is a, another EKG. Uh, they might throw this EKG at you and ask you to describe what this is. Uh, hopefully they would tell you that you have a patient who's out in the cold, has been lost, his core temperature is 32 degrees, and you put an EKG on him and you see the following, what is this? And that's the Osborne or J wave. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot, it's just there. Uh, but uh, they like to throw it in as a question. And uh, here are some other uh, J waves here. Now, the hypothermic myocardium, the cold heart, is extremely irritable. And uh, VFib can be induced by some interventions that heart, uh, stimulate the heart. For example, that's why they tell you, if you find a patient who is cold and uh, they're otherwise you know, doing okay, be careful not to move them a lot. Uh, don't be rough when you're starting an IV and uh, because you're going to, as you move that extremity, perhaps lift up that extremity, you're gonna pour all that cold blood back into the circulation of an already irritable heart and you can induce the fib uh, relatively rapidly. So what is your treatment? Um, treatment is very important and this is what you're going to do uh, if you're a paramedic and they're in the back of your ambulance that's great 
but most of you will be involved with these people when you're out on a search and rescue uh, mission. So you're gonna try and stop further heat loss, that's number one. Uh, begin the warming process by passive external warming. That means a good hot blanket with good forced heat if possible. Uh, some type of active external warming, uh, such as uh, a sun blanket or a uh, heated uh, bear hugger would be great. And then um, as you move along, you're gonna do some active internal rewarming by using warmed oxygen and warm IV fluids. And we'll go over a couple of other procedures in a few minutes. One of the easiest things to do, uh, which we do all the time in ski patrol, is if we have found an injured patient or a patient who's been missing uh, and maybe suffered an injury, a broken leg or something like that, skiing alone or uh, snowmobiling alone, uh, as soon as we get to them, we um, apply one of these hypothermia burrito wraps. Uh, we apply heat to the core, uh, to the groin, uh, under the axilla, uh, to the neck, and then you try and uh, burrito wrap this person as soon as possible. In the ambulance, you're gonna begin some active internal warming if possible um, with warm IV fluids. And we get this person to the emergency department we'll do a lot more. And I'll go over those in a few minutes. Uh, you're gonna try and maintain the horizontal position as much as possible. Uh, the vertical position may compromise cerebral blood flow and uh, centralized systemic perfusion. You're gonna avoid the rough movements that I talked about because you've got a hyper irritable heart at this point in time. And you're gonna handle the victim very gently uh, during all processes, including CPR, intubation, bag valve masking, starting an IV, and anything where you think you're going to move those extremities. Cardiac arrest. This is still a, a, a changing dynamic. So this uh, slide changes frequently. Um, based on current uh, protocols uh, and whatever your local protocols are. Generally with V-fib, you're gonna defibrillate them up to three times. If you can get an ET tube with warmed humidified oxygen and warmed IV fluid, uh, that would be great. Uh, if the temperature is less than 30, um, you're gonna limit your CPR sometimes to uh, three shocks uh, and try and withhold IV medications. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then uh, continue rewarming as much as possible. This is the old adage, uh, they're not dead until they're warm and dead. So CPR will continue no matter what. If you've got a, 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 a Lucas machine or something like that, you're gonna put them on continuous CPR. Uh, you're gonna limit the shocks. Um, and you're gonna be very, very careful with uh, IV medications. As they warm up, there is a chance that the myocardium uh, and the heart will become more sensitive and will react to medications as they warm. All right, let's talk a little bit about rewarming methods. Uh, first, there's passive uh, rewarming. Uh, that's the endogenous heat production we already talked about where uh, the metabolic rate goes up. Uh, thyroid stimulating hormone is released by the body. Sympathetic uh, ions are released such as adrenaline and shivering happens. Um, all these involve decreasing heat loss. Um, also uh, passively, you're gonna try and remove them as quickly from the cold environment as possible. When we talk about cold related injuries, We'll uh, talk a little bit about what to do about frozen extremities. Uh, remove any wet clothes as uh, much as possible. And of course, replace them with dry, warm clothes or a heating blanket and uh, provide some type of blanket uh, to keep them dry and warm. Uh, passive rewarming will 
increase oxygen consumption. Um, and you can also get an increase in CO2 production. So you might see a spike in your end tidal CO2. The body will increase its metabolism and the anaerobic metabolism will increase. And um, passive rewarming is a method of choice for mild hypothermia. And it's an adjunct to the treatment of moderate hypothermia. Active external rewarming, um, that's heat to the body surfaces, such as heating blankets, um, Arctic suns, et cetera. There are some Arctic suns that make people cold and there are Arctic uh, suns or bear blankets that make people warm. Uh, these air blankets like bear huggers are a good example. Radiant warmers, uh, concentrating heat on people with uh, radiant heat. Um, immersion in a hot bath, we'll talk about that a little bit, but this is not very practical for most people in the uh, environment. In fact, uh, most people aren't going to have something warm enough to put uh, a patient in. And most of the time, uh, they won't have such a, a bathtub available. But water bottles and heating pads are certainly available. And uh, things that are less effective, um, they can be less effective if the patient is vasoconstricted and their extremities are cold and you're trying to make sure that you warm the core of the body. With active ex uh, external rewarming, you're gonna be careful with after drop. That means watch out for that cold extremity as you move it and heat it cold, ice cold uh, fluid such as blood can be dumped into the core and make the heart more uh, irritable. Normally you wanna get about one centimeter, uh, one degree centigrade to two and a half degrees centigrade per hour. So you don't have to do this rapidly. Uh, you can get circulatory problems uh, by uh, applying to the trunk only, you can decrease some of that after drop problem. So get the core warm first. And uh, as soon as the core is warmed, then you can rewarm the extremities so that after drop doesn't happen. Um, the problem is with anything is there's very few controlled studies, uh, mostly done with animals and very little uh, done with humans as to how to do this. It's kind of hard to do a double blind study when these types of things don't happen uh, as frequently uh, or often in one place or another. Again, uh, core rewarming, uh, different ways, warm IV fluids, uh, warm, humid oxygen, if you can make that available. And in the emergency room, we can do a few things. We can uh, puncture uh, a small hole just below the navel, and we can put warm water into the intestinal area as peritoneal lavage. Uh, we can put a nasogastric tube down and put warm water in the stomach. Uh, we can put a catheter in and put warm water into the bladder or a rectal tube in and put warm water into the rectum. Uh, you could put a chest tube in and do mediastinal lavage by putting warm water into the space between the lungs and the core of the body. Diathermy is something that you might see at your chiropractor's office. It kind of generates uh, movement. It's a small way of microwaving uh, without putting somebody inside a microwave oven, but it just generates movement of uh, water ions and extracorporeal uh, rewarming. This is what got a lot of attention some 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 
uh, something that happened right here in Oregon called the Mount Hood Experience. It was a small group of um, uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers who went to climb uh, Mount Hood on a sunny day when a uh, bad storm moved in. Uh, there were some 45 students up there, I believe, uh, from a small school. And uh, the uh, storm moved in so quickly that they kind of had to dig in and uh, uh, wait for help. And the people who lived um, are the ones who were evacuated to areas where they had the ability to take them to the operating room and put them on a heart and lung bypass machine uh, to warm up uh, their circulation that way. It's some interesting reading uh, about um, treatment of large parties uh, that might be lost and hypothermic. Um, if you go looking maybe through some of your textbooks, uh, you'll find uh, references for that. Um, use saline, not lactated ringers, because uh, you're trying to uh, prevent uh, acidosis. Um, you can microwave the saline uh, if it's just normal saline. Um, about one liter of saline, about two minutes at high power in a microwave will usually produce enough heat uh, to uh, start uh, warming IV fluids. Uh, you cannot do this for red blood cells, of course, because they will uh, break down and you'll get hemolysis and that will actually injure the kidneys and people can get a transfusion reaction. So you can do it for saline, but nothing else. Uh, warm humidified oxygen is something that uh, sometimes respiratory therapists can do. Uh, it will prevent further heat loss. You don't get a whole lot of heat gain from it. It primarily helps you not lose as much heat. And it's very important in the management of the hypothermic patient if it is possible in uh, the hospital. In the emergency department, there's a couple of little odd facts and figures about um, hypothermia. Uh, Brentilium is a medication that was popular many years ago, and then it kind of fell off the earth and fell out of ACLS protocols. And just recently, it started to creep back in uh, to some of our uh, cardiac uh, algorithms. Uh, it is recommended for V-fib and hypothermia. Um, it's still recommended in some other textbooks. Uh, and the problem is finding it. But now that there's some published articles where it's been shown to be beneficial in some other treatment areas, uh, you might find Brentilium around again. This is just a copy of our local protocol for hyperthermia. And it's pretty much everything that we've talked about so far. Um, so check your local protocols and um, you're going to determine, uh, you know, are they breathing? Do they need to be uh, intubated and CPR? And then boom, boom, boom down here, you can see and this is everything that we've talked about and I won't uh, continue. Uh, I won't go over that again. Um, again, you're going to remove wet clothing, uh, cardiac monitor, and again, ABCs, and then move that way. All right, um, we're gonna leave hypothermia and we're gonna go on to just cold weather injuries. And uh, they're broken down into three uh, different categories. Uh, the non-freezing type, which is hypothermia that we just talked about, uh, chillblains, uh, which is another form of uh, cold-related injury, and then trench foot and immersion foot, uh, freezing, which can be frost nip or frost bite, and then associated injuries such as snow blindness, which is a form of a, a corneal um, burn that happens from bright lights, and then dehydration, which can also happen 
because we sweat too much and the uh, majority of heat related or cold related victims do have a form of dehydration. All right, let's talk about uh, frostbite or frost nip. Uh, first degree frostbite is just a partial freezing of the skin. Uh, sometimes it's a sensation of stinging and it's very superficial and it's not a permanent cold weather injury. Uh, the signs and symptoms are redness, um, sometimes paleness to the cheeks or the exposed area, sometimes mild swelling to the extremities. And the treatment is pretty simple to warm them immediately. Uh, dry or wet um, warming, uh, depending on where you are. You're not going to use wet warming if you're still out in a cold environment, uh, but try and uh, put them in uh, dry gloves or a dry blanket or dry heated towel, uh, something to that effect right away. Second degree frostbite um, is evident um, usually by this blistering and we don't see the blistering all the time right away. Uh, usually they're clear blisters that look almost like a burn. And if you think uh, like a burn, first degree would be something like sunburn and second degree would be blistering. And that's the same for uh, secondary frostbite. Usually gets a numbness or a burning pain in the extremities. And it usually involves the entire epidermis and that's why it bubbles. Um, you get a skin redness in very fair individuals and you might get a grayish discoloration in darker skinned individuals. Uh, these clear blisters usually form in 24 to 36 hours and they're kind of sheet-like when they break away and, and um, fall away. And um, you do usually wind up with some lasting uh, permanence of cold sensitivity in that area. If you've ever had or talked to a patient who's had frostbite in the past, they'll tell you that uh, they're very careful in the future because uh, they are extremely sensitive to cold in the future. Uh, frostbite is a true uh, freezing injury of the tissues and you can uh, wind up with a sudden blanching of the skin and nose uh, followed by tingling um, and usually uh, Frostbite has declared itself when these areas become painless. Uh, you can see it's in the digits like this and most frequently in the homeless, we'll see it in their feet. Intense coldness followed by numbness. Third degree frostbite <clears throat> usually shows a uh, blue gray discoloration. <clears throat> these blisters uh, tend to bleed like up here and you get a loss of sensation and a pale yellow waxy looking skin um, if the extremity has been frozen and you unthaw it. <clears throat> you get very, very poor capillary refill. So when you press on a toe, uh, you're not gonna see it come back very quickly and you start to get tissue loss, which we'll talk about a little bit. And then you can tend to get these hemorrhagic bullae. These are big, blood blisters that bleed and they form like 12 to 35 hours afterwards uh, unless rewarming is relatively rapid and treatment is provided fairly quickly. Uh, fourth degree frostbite, uh, you get a deep aching and blueness and uh, you get a red discoloration uh, and very quickly <clears throat> the fourth degree um, is followed by a gangrene and usually auto amputation. People lose fingers, thumbs, and toes. Uh, this is a permanent anatomical loss. Okay, I lied about the traffic.
Like, these dudes are totally mental. Just getting big air is dangerous enough. That's why they picked them out the road nobody ever drives on. Except during ski season. All right. Um, these are therapeutic and therapeutic approaches um, in hypothermia. And this is a true history. Uh, one of our local EMS agencies, we had a 40 year old male with a history of depression, IV drug abuse, uh, methamphetamine abuse, post traumatic stress disorder, uh, who attempted suicide with an intentional overdose of heroin uh, while he was in uh, a homeless shelter. Uh, his friends discovered him <clears throat> and uh, spent several hours trying to resuscitate him um, from his heroin overdose by injecting him um, with various things such as uh, methamphetamine. They figured if they gave him some methamphetamine, it would reverse uh, his heroin. Uh, it was November here in Central Oregon, which can be a very, very cold time. Uh, after failing to revive their friend, they decided to uh, transport the patient uh, by a private vehicle to the ER. Uh, they maintained his airway by uh, positive pressure uh, in a very unique way. They kind of stuck his head out the window and drove uh, really fast. Uh, and then they kind of just left him at the ER entrance um, and one friend stayed behind to give some history and everybody else kind of took off. Uh, on arrival, his uh, blood pressure was 93 over 68. His saturations were almost negligible at 55. So the open airway method didn't really help. Uh, his temperature was 31 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, GCS of eight, pulse of 80 and respirations of six. So I'd say this has been disproven as a good means of providing positive pressure ventilation. So on arrival to the emergency room, we uh, immediately uh, were told that there was heroin involved uh, and we gave uh, some Narcan. Uh, he began to arouse a little bit and uh, because he seemed to be clamped down and had just terrible veins to begin with, uh, we placed an IO immediately in the upper tibial area. Uh, rapid sequence intubation was undertaken. Uh, there was vomitus noted on the cords um, as the patient was intubated and uh, began a central line in his right groin. Uh, the blood gas showed a very acidotic patient with a pH of seven. Uh, 7.4 to 7.45 is normal. Uh, PCO2 was very high, uh, retaining CO2. Oxygen was low, saturation was low, and a urine drug stream was positive for methamphetamine and opiates. Uh, the patient was admitted to the ICU where he spent four days on a ventilator. Uh, he wound up with a secondary uh, pulmonary edema which is kind of like a congestive heart failure, uh, very commonly seen in overdose. He did wind up with an aspiration pneumonia from the vomitus uh, that was treated with IV antibiotics. <clears throat> he did have some kidney and muscle breakdown because he lay on the ground for quite a long time before they found him, and that's called rhabdomyolysis. Uh, slow rewarming was done with an Arctic sun warmer uh, psychiatric consultation uh, because he was suicidal and he uh, recovered and apparently was normal. All right. So any questions about hypothermia? Hey, Doc, I've got two. Sure. Uh, first is, uh, what is the incidence of hypoglycemia in these patients? I would imagine with the uh, uh, increased you know, muscle contractions, shivering, what have you, probably use up 
uh, glucose stores pretty quick. Sure. Um, and what is your approach going to be to that patient? Um, if they're um, not completely with it, uh, you might go ahead and approach them as you would uh, anything else. You might consider uh, what we said was a coma cocktail. You know, we give somebody a Narcan, we give them some glucose, and then uh, we might give them some, uh, you know, vitamins. Uh, so checking, that's a good question. Checking uh, for hypoglycemia in these patients is very good. Uh, remember their metabolism is slowed, so they may not be breaking down and glycolysis may have stopped or slowed down significantly. But of course, that's also going to be a great thing to check if you've got somebody with uh, you know, abnormal Glasgow uh, coma score or they're not answering questions appropriately. It could be just the coldness, or it could be they're low on sugar. So it's a great idea. Check their, uh, you're going to follow your protocols for somebody who is um, not only hypothermic, but confused, and check their blood glucose. And there was a second question or no? Yes, sir, there was. Um, second being, you had mentioned uh, saline over lactated ringers. Um, to prevent acidosis, but saline has a lower pH than yeah, lactate rivers. Um, but there are other um, elements inside LR, uh, namely potassium and phosphates, which in the um, kidneys that are slowed down and the um, metabolism that's slowed down, uh, the recommendation is to use saline over LR. Not so much for pH, but for the other uh, chemicals that are inside. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Dr. Eschelbach, there. Christian Webert says, I haven't had the EKG lessons yet, but I was wondering, is the J-wave specific to hypothermia? Yeah, the J-wave is specific to hypothermia. When you get to your EKGs, you'll find that there is a PQRST, a PQRS, and then T. Sometimes there is a, a U wave, but the J wave is very unique in its shape and its design. Um, what are you gonna do with the J wave? Not a whole lot, but um, people who write test questions love trivia, and that's uh, the reason I show that. Let's see, we've got Murph says, when I was in the Boy Scouts, we learned to treat hypothermia with free warming by body heat. While not an appropriate treatment for EMS, is this still taught to lay folks? Yeah, it, it is. And of course, um, I can think of all kinds of inappropriate things to say, but uh, that's one of the biggest excuses to have somebody uh, get naked inside of a, uh, uh, a blanket or, or a sleeping bag is you're preventing hypothermia. But you can lay your warm body on somebody else's skin to skin is conduction, right? Just as we talked about, you're going to give off heat, they're going to um, uh, gain heat. Now you have to really do that in, in an environment that's safe in like a snow cave or inside, um, you know, uh, some form of a tent or something like that. You can do it and it's been shown when uh, you take some courses on um, a mountain climbing and, and saving folks in uh, a mountain you know, they'll show you to put uh, somebody's cold feet uh, on your chest and your conduction is going to do that as well. So uh, although it's not appropriate for the EMS community, you're correct. Uh, it is a way of giving heat to somebody else. Marla says we heat our IV bags with a bear hugger in route. Um, that, that's fine. Um, we keep uh, IV bags in two places. We keep some warm saline in our blanket warmer and we keep um you know um, we can in a gif put some uh saline in a microwave and and heat it up for about two minutes it doesn't matter how you do it <clears throat> uh try not to have it too hot uh but you want to make sure it's in the lower section most blanket warmers have two sections a top that's very hot and the lower uh, section that's just warm, and you want to use your lower section. 
I remember back in the day when we didn't have any of that stuff. I can remember on the way to the scenes having Ivy bag stuff down in my jacket, in my shirt, up against my skin on the way to scenes. Uh, anyway, yeah, the dash got bags too hot, so they stopped putting them on the B-cars. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, on one of the older, earlier slides, it mentions an injury related to hypothermia. Can you go back to the slide that included slow snow blindness and elaborate on the second thing that was on the slide? I can't remember what it was called. Okay, hold on just a second. Um, that was heat-related injuries. Uh, well. um, dehydration. Uh, snow blindness can happen uh, again uh, almost like people who weld um, and arc weld without protective covering, but dehydration is an associated injury. Keep in mind that you're going to respire faster uh, when you're cold, and when you respire faster, you're going to lose heat, and you're going to lose water vapor, and you're going to become um, more dehydrated. Um, chill blains non-freezing injuries like trench foot and chillblains, these came uh, older terms that came from um, World War I actually, and it was called trench foot because people actually got their feet immersed in cold mud or water. And you get that, uh, you've seen this like if you're in the bathtub too long and you get that uh, puckering of your skin uh, where the skin doesn't freeze, but it's cold and wet, and you look like a wrinkled prune. And that's what uh, trench foot uh, looks like. Stuart, any tips on removing soaking wet clothes? We did a rescue of a fellow whose quad went through ice, but in trying to get the wet clothing off the patient, he went into V-fib. He did respond to defibrillation, but is there any good way to deal with that? Yeah. Um, well, what we do in the ER is, is cut. We use our, um, <clears throat> our trauma shears and just cut clothes right off. Now you're gonna to have to have a warm blanket. You know, if somebody's in soaking wet uh, or uh, freezing uh, um, environment, you're gonna to have to cut the clothes off and replace it very quickly uh, with a warm, dry blanket and uh, stuff them in, a, um, like I said, with water bottles if you can get them, if you have them, uh, stuff them in um, uh, by their neck, in their groin, under their axilla, and try and warm them up that way. Excellent. Okay, so we haven't heard from Will. Will, are you out there? Have you got anything? Yeah, I guess it's maybe kind of like a stupid question, but like um, for wet clothes like you kind of said putting them in a warm blanket like if you didn't have a blanket would it be better to keep the clothes on them or to remove it I guess I don't no, know really. uh, well obviously let's say you're out in the middle of a meadow and it's freezing cold and there's snow everywhere cutting somebody's clothes off and leaving them naked is not the best thing uh, perhaps uh, getting a warm blanket or a jacket from somebody else uh, to decrease that cold exchange, uh, get some kind of form of warm clothing. Um, if you're on a rescue mission, obviously, um, you're going to have some form of a warm blanket. If you're just out there, uh, you know, freelancing it, uh, like so one of your buddy fell through the ice and you rescued them, and I would try and get them into a tent and get them into a sleeping bag, anything that's dry and warm. Uh, Denya, have you got anything? We haven't heard from you. Oh, there he is. What temperature does the inside of the ambulance need to be? I assume he's talking about for transporting in. Yeah. Um, I would put it this way. You need to be, as a treating paramedic, terribly uncomfortable. You have to be hot. If you're sweating, it's just warming up for the patient. So uh, that's true of trauma, and that's true of hypothermia. You want to blast that heat. And Murph asks uh, for any specific consideration for pediatric patients. Um, the only uh, difference with pediatric patients is they have a higher surface area, 
uh, they're going to lose temperature faster. Uh, so old people and young children will lose heat faster. Uh, they have a uh, weight to surface area that's greater. So they're going to lose heat a whole lot faster. Mm. Hang on just a second. I'm making sure I got everybody screen clipped here so I can uh, make sure everybody gets credit. Just so um, can't look at chat at the same time. Uh, give me a sec. Okay. Um, chats, back to that. Anything else in chat? Chat. Oh, I got a new message here. I just got to get to it. Um, thank you, sir. From Anybody got anything else? Got a lot of thank yous. All right. Thank you. Nope. It looks like that's it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Eschelbach. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All guys. right, guys. We'll Take get this care. posted soon. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Both.